April 12, 1981. Astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen are strapped into ejection seats in the Space Shuttle Orbiter Columbia, waiting to launch from Kennedy Space Center on the first flight of the Space Shuttle, designated STS-1. There would soon be a problem that would put the mission at risk, along with the lives of the two astronauts. Why were there astronauts on the first flight test? And what was the problem? This is the near tragedy of STS-1. Now to start, I want to talk about why they had astronauts on the STS on this first flight. Now, the common reason given is because the shuttle could not land itself. And this is in fact probably true. The shuttle did have an auto land system as part of the software. It was tested on STS-3 and it did not work very well. NASA did figure out how to get it to work later. But that was not the real driver for why there were pilots on this first flight. It really has to do with the flight path. Now here's a nice picture of the landing of STS-1. This is from the press kit for the flight. It was probably in color and looked a lot nicer here. But you can see the shuttle coming in over the coast of California, uh, near Southern California, flies south of ba Bakersfield, and it's headed towards Edwards Air Force Base. And the reason they wanted to land the shuttle at Edwards is Edwards is on a dry lake bed. And this dry lake bed is a wonderful runway. So think of, instead of having a normal airport runway, you have just a dry lake bed for miles. So it's very good for experimental aircraft and the shuttle is an experimental aircraft. There's kind of an issue with bringing the shuttle in here. We can draw this little shaded area and if you look at that shaded area in 1981, it holds about 8 million people. Most of those people are concentrated in Los Angeles uh, near the bottom of the area. But this was the first flight of the shuttle. It was going to attract a lot of press. It was going to attract a lot of dignitaries. And it was going to attract a lot of the public. So that meant we were going to push a lot of people up near Edwards Air Force Base. Basically, NASA made a very simple choice. They did a risk analysis and they said, when we look at this flight, if we put astronauts on the shuttle, they will have risk during ascent, during orbit, and they will have risk when they come back and land. But if we don't fly astronauts, we won't have any way to deal with things if the auto land does not work. So it's basically a trade-off between risking the lives of the astronauts to risking the lives of the people on the ground. And the general principle for rockets is uh, you would rather risk astronaut lives than you would risk people and property on the ground. That is still the way uh, rockets are viewed. That is why NASA made this choice here. Uh, it's really a protection choice. Now, there's an obvious question to ask at this point. Why wouldn't you do a water landing? So Starship has a orbital flight scheduled, we hope next year. And their plan, they will fly around the Earth, they won't quite get into orbit, and they will take Starship and they will land it in the water north of the Hawaiian Islands. And thing to know that Starship 20, which is their first prototype, it is a prototype and it is obsolete at the launch. SpaceX is working through a long series of prototypes for Starship, and whenever they have one built and ready to launch, they are working on the next one, and the next one is better in many ways. This version of Starship is going to fly around, and even if they did land it, they would never use it again. They might put it uh, next to their factory, or they might send it to a museum, or there are all sorts of things they would do with it, but it isn't a real vehicle. Shuttle is a very different beast. Columbia is roughly a billion dollar asset. It's about what it costs to make these, and it's expected to fly for years. So NASA took a different approach. They didn't build prototypes. They kind of built one for air tests uh, called Enterprise, but even that was supposed to become a real shuttle. 
they had these very expensive orbiters and they did not want to take them into the water and just throw one away, especially because they expected to do multiple test flights. So getting the orbiter back was a very high priority. If you want to understand why Shuttle took this sort of approach rather than the SpaceX approach, another video I will link up in the corner called Space Shuttle What Went Wrong, and it describes the forces that led NASA to take this approach. Let's go on and talk about the actual problems that occurred on the flight. Now, I need to do a brief digression here to talk about airplanes because the shuttle orbiter is in fact an airplane or at least a glider when it returns from orbit. We need to look at the control surfaces. At the top we have the rudder. The rudder moves the nose left to right. Under the rudder we have a horizontal stabilizer and at the back of that is what's called an elevator and that elevates the nose or moves it down, moves it up and down. And then finally on the wings, near the outside of the wings, we have what are called ailerons. And if you lift one aileron up and the other one down, the plane will roll to one side. And if you reverse them, the plane will roll to the other side. Those are the basic control surfaces on most airplanes. Now this also shows flaps. Flaps are typically movable surfaces. They don't really control the, the direction of the plane. They give you more lift for things like landing. And I'll explain why I'm talking about flaps as well in a minute. Now let's look at what we have on the orbiter. And the first thing you notice is the orbiter doesn't really have a wing and a horizontal stabilizer. It has a single body. Uh, and that's known as a delta wing. So let's look at the control surfaces. At the top, we have the rudder, which is pretty much like a normal airplane rudder. At the back of the delta wing, we have these two surfaces. They are usually called elevons because they combine the operation of the ailerons and the elevators. So if you push both of these up or both of these down, they act like elevators. If you push one up and one down, they act like ailerons. So it's a pretty common thing in fighter jets or any airplane that uses a delta wing, uh, typically uses elevons. Because the shuttle has to fly from very, very fast when it's re-entering the Earth down to very low speeds, it has some aerodynamic problems. The amount of lift you get from various parts of the wing changes based upon how fast you are flying. The elevons are not enough to control that, so they have this other control surface at the back called the body flap. And here we see a professional drawing I did of the body flap. It's not close to this big, but the body flap is in yellow and it's below the engines. It can move up a little, about 11 degrees up, and it can move down 22 degrees. And this allows you to set, or allows the computer that flies shuttle to set what is called the trim. Normally when they'd be coming in very, very fast, they would have too much lift at the front of the orbiter and that would tend to pick the nose up and it would go too high and you would lose control. So the body flap hanging down in the back prevents that or counteracts that. It provides what is called often called trim in an airplane. Um, you have this control surface to keep essentially the orbiter flying at the angle that you want it to fly. Now the normal range for the body flap is zero degrees, essentially flat, to nine degrees hanging down. That is what they expected. Here's a neat little picture that shows construction of the shuttles. Uh, on the floor you can see the body flap and up above it, you can see the rear end of the orbiter. Those three holes are where the three main engines will ultimately go. Then they lift it up. Here it is hanging in the air, and they are starting to attach it to the hinge at the back, and that will allow it to move up and down. And you also notice that the body flap is covered with the same sort of thermal tiles that the base of the shuttle is covered with. This really isn't much of a surprise. It is going to be subjected to re-entry heat like all of the bottom of the shuttle. 
And here finally is a nice liftoff picture I found with the body flap circle, uh, circled. So you can see it just kind of hangs out and it's just kind of in between where the big solid rocket boosters on the left and the main engines of the shuttle on the right. It's kind of between those two. What was the first issue? Solid rockets, when you light them, put out what is called an overpressure. And I have a neat little video to show you here. This is actually a test of the SLS rocket, solid rockets, which are kind of upgraded versions of the, the solids they flew with shuttle, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, what I want you to do when you look at the video is not watch the rocket, but in the foreground here we have all of these shrubbery uh, or bushes, and I want you to watch what they do. Let's do that one more time. Four, three, two, one, fire. And we have ignition of NASA's Space Launch System solid rocket motor. What I notice when that happens is the bushes kind of get pushed to one side when the solid ignites and then they kind of come back and then they get pushed to the side and then they kind of come back and then it kind of uh, slows down or damps down. And if you've ever been to a big firework display, you know that you can feel a concussion when the fireworks go. This is the same sort of effect. There's actually this big overpressure or concussion when these solid rocket boosters are lit. How does that affect the shuttle? Here we have the shuttle in normal launch attitude. It's sitting on the launch pad. This is a close-up. This area here that's labeled with search area, this square part, is the mobile launcher. The solid rocket boosters are actually bolted to the solid, to the mobile launcher here. That is what holds the whole shuttle up. So they're bolted to it. The external tank is attached in between the two solid rocket boosters. And then the shuttle is actually hung from the external tank. So the shuttle itself has no support on the launch pad. It's just hanging on the solid rocket boosters. What happens is when you light the solid rocket booster, it sends out that overpressure and that overpressure reflects around inside of this mobile launch tower and it ends up coming back and hitting the orbiter. Now the pressure, you remember when we looked at the the branches or the shrubbery, it moved to the side and then it moved back and then it moved to the side. And this is what the pressure actually looks like during the ignition of the solids. You can see three, well that's that first big movement. Then down here at four, it's actually moved back. So three is a positive pressure, three is a negative, uh, four is a negative pressure that pulls back. Five is a positive pressure but less and then uh, you have a negative pressure that's less and then it kind of damps out. That is pretty much what we saw with the bushes. And what happens is that pressure reflects off all of these things and it comes, it comes up and it hits the shuttle and shakes it around. Now in particular, the body flap hanging down here at the back gets pushed to the side. NASA had done a bunch of analysis as to how big the overpressure would be with these solid rocket boosters, and they'd done small tests, uh, tests on smaller models, and they thought they understood it pretty well. It turned out they did not, and the overpressure wave they saw on this first flight was much bigger than they expected, and it essentially slammed into the shuttle, and it pushed the body flap very strongly towards the engines. Now, some of the information around this says that the amount of pressure they put on the body flap actually exceeded its design strength so that it was expected that something bad could happen. And that bad might be that the body flap got pushed up and stuck in one position. That would be bad on reentry because, as I said, you need it to hang down to keep the shuttle under control. The other thing that could have happened is it could have broken the hydraulic system for it and you could have ended up with a hydraulic leak and all of the shuttle control surfaces and everything in the shuttle runs on hydraulic pressure. So if you lose hydraulic pressure, you are probably having a pretty bad day as well, certainly without being able to move 
The body flap, due to lack of hydraulics, means you cannot re-enter successfully. So that was the first issue. The second issue is uh, kind of a mistake of analysis. As I said, when shuttle comes in, it needs the body flap to be hanging down to give it the right aerodynamics. And NASA uh, essentially made a mistake. And I'm going to show you what it said. This is verbatim from the STS-1 mission report that NASA produced after the flight. And it said, the body flap extended to 14 degrees, exceeding the planned trim attitude of 8 to 9 degrees during entry from Mach 22 to Mach 12. So that is the early part of the re-entry when the shuttle is flying very, very fast. Post-flight analysis of longitudinal trim characteristics indicates that the aerodynamic predictions for pitch trim at hypersonic speeds, these very high speeds, were in error. NASA simply did not do the analysis correctly. Because of that, that meant that the body flap didn't have to go down to 8 degrees or 9 degrees. It had to go to 14 degrees, 5 degrees more than expected. So why was this problematic? Well, I found this really neat picture or series of pictures to illustrate this. NASA has an aircraft to look at re-entry vehicles and see how they are heating. So the aircraft has a large infrared camera, and this is a picture from a much later shuttle flight. This is from STS-128, showing the bottom of a shuttle as it re-enters. Now, very nicely, they have all the information here I want. Uh, they're flying at Mach, about Mach 15, so they've slowed down a little bit, and the body flap is currently at seven and a half degrees. What I want you to notice is how red the body flap is. It is really the hottest part of the shuttle that we can see. The front is pretty hot, the wings are fairly hot in some cases, but the body flap is really hot. And the reason it's really hot is it's hanging down into that very hot plasma that comes when you are re-entering. We know that this is very hot here, and this is only at 7.5 degrees. And on STS-1, the body flap went all the way to 14 degrees, or almost double that. What it means is NASA not only needed to move the body flap more, now luckily they had the range to do that, but the body flap had to deal with heating much higher than they expected. Luckily, the body flap held. It did not overheat, and it did not melt or break or do anything else that would have caused uh, the real tragedy. But they kind of uh, got lucky on this one. Here are some other pictures later. Uh, this is actually a different flight, but this shows slightly slower, and the body flap is only at 1.9 degrees. And you can see at 1.9 degrees, it's pretty cool. It doesn't have a lot of heating. So you can tell from 1.9 to 7.5 has a huge increase in heating. Think of what 7.5 to 14 has. And then finally, we have another picture. This is very slow or much slower. I guess Mach 8 is not very slow, but they've slowed down a lot. The body flap is still at 1.8 degrees, but now the heating has moved to different parts of the aircraft. That is why that prediction uh, was problematic. Finally, there was a third issue, and I'll once again go to the mission report. It says the forward RCS oxidizer aft Z strut failed in Euler buckling due to the liftoff dynamic response from the SRB overpressure. I think I'm going to need to unpack that a little bit. Let's start at the end. We already talked about SRB overpressure. That was the same thing that led to possible issues on the body flap. That overpressure, as I said, kind of like grabbing the shuttle and shaking it. Near the front of the shuttle, right here in the nose, they have part of the RCS, or reaction control system. And this is a set of small rocket motors, usually called thrusters, that are used to move the shuttle around in orbit. If you look at the picture, you see here at the top, it says primary thruster. And this is a set of three thrusters that point up or above the thrust, uh, above the shuttle. So if you fire those, that pushes the nose down. There are some on the, on the front here, pointing towards the front. If you fire those, it pushes the shuttle back. 
Um, and then there are ones to roll the shuttle as well. And there's a no, whole other set of these at the back of the orbiter with their own system. So you have all of these, and these are just used to move the shuttle around. That is the RCS system. It was the one in the front. And what happened was the shaking of the shuttle due to the overpressure caused a problem with one of the struts. Now, I couldn't find any pictures of the shuttle struct. I looked at lots of pictures. Here is a picture of a strut and an oxidizer tank. Um, this is from one of the uh, Viking landers, I believe. The struts are these two little metal rigid bodies. And so struts are something rigid that attach from uh, essentially the, the main structure to something like a propellant tank. In this case, an oxidizer tank. What it means is in the front of the shuttle, we had an oxidizer tank. It was held with struts and one of them failed. And Euler buckling is kind of the engineering speak for how it failed. Failing struts can be pretty bad. If you followed SpaceX, you would know that they lost a Falcon 9 launch due to a failing strut. In the second stage, a strut failed, a helium tank came loose, all the helium came out. That gave them a huge overpressure inside the propellant tank and it essentially blew the second stage apart. Strut failures can be a really big deal. Uh, in this case, uh, this wasn't super high pressure. The SpaceX one was very high pressure, but this was not a super high pressure tank. But the problem is this had uh, an oxidizer called dinitrogen tetroxide. And the whole RCS system uses what are called hypergolic propellants. And hypergolic propellants are ones where you just mix them together and they catch on fire which is great for systems like these. It means your thrusters are very simple. You just put the two propellants in, they light on fire, you take the propellants away, they go out. So they're very, very easy control to control and they are very, very reliable. Pretty much all thrusters use hypergolics. The problem with hypergolics is they are really, really nasty. They're very corrosive and if you happen to breathe in this current one, this oxidizer, it converts to nitric acid, acid in your lungs, and that is very, very damaging. If the strut had failed uh, in a very bad way and the tank had come loose, we would have this oxidizer inside of the nose of the orbiter, and that would attack anything like rubber, probably attack seals, it would attack fittings, it would probably attack the nose wheel, and it might make its way into the actual pressurized volume where the astronauts are. So if this had actually broken enough to break the line free, that would have been a, a very bad day. Um, luckily, it did not turn out to be that big of a deal. Those were the three things that came up. Any of them could have been much, much worse. It turned out that NASA kind of got lucky, but I'd want to talk about the fixes because I think that's almost as interesting as the problems themselves. To deal with the SRB overpressure, NASA came up with this whole list of different things they could do. So the first class was what they called source reduction. How do we just reduce the overpressure? And you could inject water into the SRB exhaust. You could redesign the boosters so they put out less pressure. And then there were these fun things. You could inject foam in them, or you could put bags of helium in the launcher or in the flame trench underneath, or you could modify the flame trench to get rid of parts. You could cover over the hole where the solid rockets essentially exhaust into that mobile launcher, putting trapdoors or a shield up on the mobile launcher or uh, some of my fa favorites, you could put in a trough filled with water or what they called water bar barriers, which are just sausages of some material, It'd be like fire hose filled with water. Or you could redesign the mobile launcher so that the pressure didn't really bounce around, it went kind of out to the sides. NASA, when they wanted to fix this, they wanted something they could do that was quick because they wanted to move on to the next flight, and they wanted it to do something that they knew would work or felt confident would work. They chose the very first thing, pretty much the first thing they came up with. 
And here we have the top of the mobile launcher. You remember earlier I said the solid rockets were bolted to the mobile launcher. Here, that part I made just gray, that is the base of the solid rocket. And you can see there are four little posts, post, 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 post. And that is where it is actually bolted down. They added all of this new piping around the outside. Um, and that's going to carry high pressure water. And then over here, there's this little, kind of like a sprinkler head, a very big sprinkler head and it can spray water directly into the exhaust that's coming out of the solid rocket motor. And they get enough water in there and that absorbs a lot of energy when it first starts and that gets rid of the overpressure, or at least that was the theory. I found some nice data that they took on STS-1 and on the next flight. There is the STS-2 overpressure and you compare that to the large amounts of overpressure on the first flight, and you can see this was very, very effective. And they only see small amounts of changes in pressure compared to the really big one for STS-1. This was a pretty good fix, and they didn't really have any issues later in shuttle on this. What about the RCS struts? What they basically did is they strengthened them, and they replaced the struts the aft Z struts, and aft Z basically means uh, the shuttle has different axes. You have an X in one direction, Y in one, Z in another. So they replaced all of those on both the fuel and the oxidizer tanks, and they replaced it with a strut reinforced with some composite materials. There's a boron epoxy uh, sort of in, uh, composite. And it kind of looks like the picture above. This is actually a NASA strut from a helicopter but uh, it's the basic idea if you can think of what it's like. Um, they also had connections at the end of the struts um, and they made them a little bit bigger and a little bit beefier, so they were a little stronger. While they were in that area, um, there was heat shield uh, also held with struts, so they reinforced some of those. They replaced the ones that were there. They put a, a better struts back. And then finally, they looked throughout the orbiter. The struts are kind of a category called a large mass support system. Around the orbiter, in a lot of places, you have things that are heavy, like these tanks of fuel, and you need some way of attaching them to the structure of the orbiter. So struts are one way to do it. There are other ways of doing it, depending on what you're actually trying to support. So they basically went through and did all of their analysis over again to make sure they had what they would call a positive margin, to make sure the system was stronger than it needed to be. Finally, to fix the body flap angle, NASA was kind of lucky in design here. What they say, the Elevon schedule will be adjusted on STS-2 to relieve body flap heating. Basically, those little Elevons at the back had been set up so they were up above the wing, just by a degree. They were up above and out of that hot plasma stream. And that gave them a little nice little option. They just moved them so that they were down at about one degree. And essentially what they're doing is they're moving some of the aerodynamic control from that body flap to the elevons. So the elevons move down two degrees, and that allows them to move the body flap up a little bit. And so the elevons get a little more heating, the body flap gets less heating. Um, that covers what I wanted to talk about. They got lucky that the body flap was not damaged by this very high overpressure. They got lucky that the body flap could deflect more than they needed it to, and that it could actually absorb the additional heat load during that portion of the flight. And they got lucky that the even though the struts were damaged on the forward oxidizer tank, they weren't damaged enough to lead to an oxidizer leak. That's the story of what happened on STS-1. Thanks for your attention. Please subscribe.